Greetings. Elder Blacklight. The subject is the war of Armageddon. Or who will win the race war? Either way you cut it, that's what it's all about. I'm here to show these illusional black people that it always have been a war. What I'm about to show you is uh, I've been talking about Detroit, the 67 uh, rebellion. There was one, one before that. You see that sign say, war here, I mean war abroad and war at home, right? Let's get to it so you know what I'm talking about. pursuit of happiness went on in the valley and on the strip the folks worked when and where they could and on the weekend they parted late into night arising to meet another day but suddenly and with awesome consequences the sons and daughters of Hastings were given the employment opportunity of a lifetime and off toward they went While the sons of Hastings Street went off to war, its daughters went into the supporting industrial arena, and many a brown rosy plied her skill with the rivet. Concerned residents joined Civil Defense and Neighborhood Patrol units in an effort to be vigilant on the home front. While conflict raged in the world theaters of war, another struggle continued and intensified at home. In 1942, there was a significant racial turmoil when a group of angry whites sought to block black people from moving into the new Sojourner Truth housing development in the northeast section of Detroit. Then, on a steamy June night in 1943, an altercation broke out between blacks and whites on Belle Island. False reports that a black child had been thrown off the bridge spread rapidly, and soon Hastings Street and Detroit turned into a battlefield. I was right there when it happened at Sonny Wilson's. Louis Jordan was there that night. It was on a Sunday night. And the dance had started, and I was right up at the stage, right at the front of the stage, looking up in Louis Jordan's mouth. Thing, you know, a guy, he run up, jumped on the stage, and snatched the mic out of Louis Jordan's hands. So everybody go out to Bell Alley having a race ride out there. So people piled up in cars. We got down as far as anywhere around Salivar or Kirchville. I saw the policemen beating little kids eight, nine years old with their nightsticks and dragging them behind their motorcycle. I saw it. And everybody that was in the car with me, they all dead now. But it's still, it might be a few that left that was there when it happened. And see how it started. And they told us we didn't want the same thing to get the hell away from there. And we were all grown and away, you know. We were all working. So, but we had respect for the law. There's nothing we could do but do what they say. That's what we did. We went on away from there. Some stopped in the valley. We went back up to Sunny's. It actually started two weeks earlier at the uh, old uh, Eight Mile uh, Amusement Park, Eastwood Park. Two weeks prior to the night it broke out, it started out the Eastwood Park because they stopped blacks from going out the East, to the dance hall. All the big bands would come through there because they would fight every time they go out there. So they stopped the blacks from going to the dance hall. You know, all the big bands would come through there. But it actually started out in Eastwood Park two weeks before it broke out in Bell Isle. Well, it was on a Sunday, and I was at a club meeting, 
And as I was getting ready to leave the meeting, I noticed that there were fires all up and down 12th Street. And I had to make it home, of course, but I didn't realize that the riot had gotten so far out of hand and people were getting killed and they were looting stores um, all over the city. And I recall we lived on Canfield at the time and we lived next door to a Dr. Beth and on the other side of us was three white sisters, three white women, they were older women, and they had been beaten up and we were able to save one of them uh, and then we took them in our home until the riot was over. But it was just nothing but blood and fire and bloodshed. It was just awful. That's one day I'll never forget. The, uh, that riot was uh, a result of foreigners coming in, particularly from overseas, and wherever their relatives sent for them. Because, you know, we were having a, mi a great migration of, farmer, of foreigners coming into the city. And I guess if you would look at it, we were coming from the south at the same time. But I think the reason and the cause of that was uh, some of those ideas were brought from the old country because they had never dealt with blacks. And sometimes, and I have no proof of it, but I think their relatives uh, tried to say to them, well, you know, don't pay any attention. And that was truly a race, right, because it was on Woodward Avenue, the dividing line for the city of Detroit. And they were in certain areas there, and these, the fighting began uh, right in that area on Woodward, downtown, not all the way downtown, I would say around uh, Putnam and through in there. And that's where the blacks were attacked at. Of course, the blacks retaliated also. And the police were there usually themselves at that time. We had very few, if we, we could count our black policemen. And uh, certainly we had uh, a lot of uh, that going on because the blacks fought back in the terms if you were on this side of, which is the east side of Woodward, uh, they attacked also. But I truly call that a race riot. I can remember very well that the uh, whites were in the Three Sixes Bar. I'm sorry. Yes, the Three Sixes, owned by Jeff Sneed, was one of the finest nightclubs in the United States at the time. And we didn't know what was going on until suddenly Mr. Sneed started letting the white patrons out of the back door. That was a terrific nightclub. And that's when we kind of came out and find it was a riot. It was a false rumor that was started that a white couple had threw a black baby over the bridge at Bell Island. And the boy that made that statement, he made it at Forest Club, and his name was Leo Tipton. We later had problems about that, but Leo Tipton just grabbed the microphone at a dance and made that announcement. And of course, we had two black officers who were attending the dance. By the grace of God, Jesse Stewart is still living and he was one of the first black sergeant. And uh, his co-partner was Larry Bleach who passed last year. They were put on the carpet because they wanted to know why didn't they arrest Leo Tippin for making that statement. But of course they were found uh, not guilty and they were not suspended, but they attempted to suspend them for that situation. But that was a riot. So much different that we're not even asking about what happened in 67. But I was a young girl when the riots came, but I do remember uh, we were at home from school that day. They sent us home early and they told us that the whites were coming across the track and we lived on the other side of the track. And we were so afraid to even go out the door because they said the mob was coming, the white mobs, and they had uh, bats and sticks and stones, and they were coming across the track to to uh, kill the blacks, you know. And my mother being so strict, she wouldn't let us go out. But I do remember one of the old school teachers from Garfield uh, Elementary School called to see if we were okay because she was worried about the people coming across the track to try to kill the black people. And uh, we were just so scared to death that we couldn't even go out the door. We just stayed in. Well, it was uh, a lot of in interesting things happened during the riot. One, some of them very humorous. One story I remember where uh, a fellow was standing in front of a pawn shop. You know, most all the white people vacated as soon as they found, got the word that the riot was on. 
and that went for the pawn shops and the white stores, tents and so whatever it was on A Street, all the businesses. But this particular pawn, pawn shop, I think, his name was, uh, the guy I ran, his name was Eli, something like that. And all the more uh, arrogant blacks would go in there and come out with, uh, uh, they didn't have TVs then anyway, but with the, uh, whatever you could carry of value, guns and, you know, uh, honey, rifles and things like that, clothes. Yeah, uh, we're going to continue this on the next uh, video. I got to give credit to the brother whose uh, video this is. I found it on YouTube. But uh, as you see, we've been doing this for a long time. The same thing Back then, it was war overseas and war at home. The same thing is happening in 2019. A war overseas and a war at home. This is Black Light. This will be continued.